Michio, the fine-tuning of our universe, the apparent setting of the laws of physics, just so to make stars and galaxies and planets and people and consciousness all work together is something that cries out for explanation. Some say we'll discover the ultimate law of physics which will explain it. Some say you need multi-universes so that it can select through a so-called anthropic principle. Some would pour, point to supernatural explanations, a designer. As a physicist trained uh, uh, in, in fundamental physics uh, from a Buddhist family, experienced in the Christian worldview, how do you, how do you analyze this fine-tuning? When I was in second grade, my teacher made a statement that shocked me to the core. I still remember it after all these years. She said that God so loved the earth that he put the earth just right from the sun. Not too close, because the oceans would boil. Not too far, because the oceans would freeze. I was floored. That's right. <laughs> the earth is just right from the sun. Venus does have a scorched surface. Mars is a frozen desert. We are just right from the sun. Then I grew up, and of course now we look at stars and see over 200 dead planets that are too close, that are too far from the mother sun to have liquid oceans. So the solution to the so-called Goldilocks paradox, why is the earth just right from the sun, is answered by the observation that they are dead planets. And as you alluded, now we have this paradox of fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, the sun, for example, uh, if the nuclear force were stronger, the sun would have burnt out billions of years ago, and we wouldn't be here having this conversation. If the nuclear force were weaker, the sun would never have ignited to begin with, the earth would never have formed, and we still would not be here to talk about it. So there wouldn't be a problem to solve. Right, because we wouldn't be here to discuss these right. things. But we are here. The nuclear force is fine-tuned. If gravity were stronger, the Earth would have, the universe would have had a big crunch and we'd all be burned to death. If gravity were a lot weaker, we'd all be frozen to death in a big freeze. Gravity is also just right. Well, how many Goldilocks zones are there? You start to count them and you realize, oh my God. We are just right in so many different areas. It's like a jet airplane being ripped apart by a hurricane and then suddenly reassembled <laughs> intact after the storm. That just doesn't happen by accident. So we have this paradox. Why are we in so many Goldilocks zones? Is it because God loved the universe that he put the universe just right in the Goldilocks zone? Or are there dead universes? I tend to lean toward the latter that there are dead universes out there. There are multiple universes where the sun never did ignite. Universes which popped into existence and popped right back into existence in a big crunch. And that is the direction that string theory seems to be taking us right now. Well, what, what it amounts to then are, are two vastly competing theories, if you will, to explain the fine tuning. One that says that it, it is only an illusion that it's fine-tuned because we are just one of, of a very vast number that happens to be the one where it works. And if it, we were ones, if, if we were where it didn't work, we wouldn't be there. So we wouldn't ask the question or some so kind of a, of, of a design. Now, there is the possibility, some say, though, that the way things are, even though it's so unusually perfect is, is based upon one ultimate theory that has to be this way and when we discover it we'll see that there's no other possibility. Uh, that seems to be less and less likely as an alternative today. Well there are two philosophies you can take consistent with all we know about the universe. One is the Copernican principle and the other is the anthropic principle. The Copernican principle says that there's nothing special about humans, nothing special about us, nothing special about our piece of the universe. We're very ordinary. We exist with billions and billions and trillions of stars, uh, billions of planets perhaps in the universe. We're almost insignificant. We're nothing. We're less than nothing. <laughs> That's the Copernican principle. The anthropic principle says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are special. We are so special that we're the only, perhaps the only universe among a whole collection of universes that have intelligent life. So we have two opposite extremes. 
Now, Douglas Adams, the, the humorist, okay. once wrote about the insanity machine, a machine designed to drive anyone totally <laughs> insane. You go in the machine, you see a picture of the entire universe, the entire universe with an arrow saying, you are here. <laughs> And that's designed to drive any sane person insane because you realize how insignificant. You're not even a bug. You're not even an atom. You're less than nothing with regards to the Copernican principle. I think we are special. We are special, first of all, because we have the conditions for life, DNA, and even consciousness. Our universe really is special. It is fine-tuned, perhaps fine-tuned by luck, but it is fine-tuned nonetheless. So I think we really are special. Our universe, in some sense, knew we were coming. We are in a universe that makes intelligent life possible. Does that give any corroboration, any confidence, any increased probability to some sort of a non-physical explanation for the universe? Well, some may say that maybe a god chose the universe to be where it is, and we are winners of a cosmic jackpot. Mm -hmm. However, the, the, even a Las Vegas better wouldn't give you those <laughs> odds, because the odds that we would land right precisely where the jackpot is is so small. There's several ways you can look at it. One way to look at it is that string theory, which seems to give you this multiverse of universes, is not in its final form that perhaps there is a, a form higher than string theory. I tend to lean this direction, that string theory is not in its final picture, it's not in its final form. There's another way to explain it, and this is that perhaps universes evolve, that yeah. as these universes die, baby universes are created by advanced civilizations, and the DNA is precisely the physical constants of the universe. As each universe begins to die, and baby universes are created by intelligent beings that split off, their DNA changes. The nature of stars, the structure of galaxies, they change, and an evolution takes place. This would require a super, super advanced civilization to be able to create... Unimaginably advanced, but this is consistent with the laws mm -hmm. of physics as we know them. And this would allow for an evolution of universes, so it's no accident, therefore, that our universe is, has the DNA of life, that is, the existence of stars, existence of planets in DNA. It's no accident that it has these conditions because it was a spin-off of another universe, and we are, in some sense, winners not of a cosmic jackpot. We are simply winners of survival of the fittest. So in that concept, we're, we're not the progenitor. We're not the origin that will be uh, uh, the, the, the first ones to do it. We're, we are likely, that being true, if that's true, the, the product of other civilizations and other universes. So think of a bubble bath with billions of soap bubbles, uh, most of them dead, but the soap bubbles that have life spin off more soap bubbles, more soap bubbles. So over time, those would proliferate. Those so, would proliferate. And there'd be more and more of those. Uh, we may not be able to know them or see them, but we possibly could be one of them. That's right. So in other words, perhaps there's a reason why we are just right from the sun, because we have benefited from survival of the fittest, going back unimaginable eons into the past, so that each universe has the DNA consistent with not just intelligence, but advanced intelligence.